Washoe County Library System welcomes you to our monthly series from the Nevada Historical Society presents High Noon with Neil Cobb. This afternoon's topic is the Reno Historical Website and App, presented by Alicia Barber. My name is Jennifer, and I'm happy to be here with you today. And now I would like to introduce Christina Hornbeck with the Nevada Historical Society. Again, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Hi, hey Jennifer. Thank you. thank you so much for having us be a partnership with you at the Washoe County Library. We love being a part of this program. Um, I appreciate the speaker and Neil Cobb for also being a participant. Um, I also want to remind everyone, and I'm sure many of you know, we are celebrating our 120th birthday. We uh, This is the month that we were initiated. So we'd like you to check out our website so that you can see all the different activities that we've got planned for this upcoming year to celebrate our 120 years. Uh, I'd also now like to say that it's my pleasure to introduce longtime supporter of the Nevada Historical Society and honorary curator here at the Nevada Historical Society, Neil Cobb. Thank you for the intro, Christina. Our speaker today, Alicia Barbara, PhD, is a historian, writer, and a consultant whose interests range from American West and urban history to historic preservation and tourism. She has written and taught on such subjects as tourism, cities, museum studies, memory and place, and the oral history. And she was the director of the, at the University of Nevada of the oral history program from 2009 to 2013 a member of the Nevada State Board of Museums and History. Alicia had written a very interesting book and lots, lots of success with it. It goes by the name of Reno's Big Gamble, and you want to check it out. She also writes for a wide range of publications, curates and consults on public history projects, and appears regularly in public forums as an expert on history and cultural tour tourism in Northern Nevada. She uh, and a member, and I think a chairman of the uh, Reno Historical Resources Commission and of HARPS, and that of, of course is Historic Reno Preservation Society. Alicia earned her doctorate in American studies from the University of Texas at Austin and lives in Reno with her husband and daughter, but is now a Nevada treasure. High Noon welcomes Alicia Barber. Thank you so much for that, Neil. Neil was one of the first people who I ever met in Reno, and it's more than 20 years ago now, which is kind of hard to believe, but uh, I've been here since 2003, and Neil has just been such a treasure to me as much as he is to the rest of the community, not just for the breadth of his knowledge, his expansive knowledge of Reno's history um, and his incredible photograph collection, which he's so generous with, but just for his kind heart and his just incredible enthusiasm about sharing what he knows. So thank you so much, Neil. It's such an honor to be on this series with you. The Nevada Historical Society has been fundamental to Reno Historical and so many more of my historical projects since the beginning, as has the Washoe County Library. So I'm very, very grateful to be here today talking about Reno Historical, which we're talking about celebrations and birthdays and anniversaries. Reno Historical is celebrating its 10th year anniversary this year. And again, this very month, it's a, it's a great month for historic preservation. May is National Historic Preservation Month, and it is observed as such in the city of Reno also. So um, it's exciting time for history. I feel like there is a great, great and growing interest in history locally uh, as well as nationally. And we're always trying to find new ways, new platforms, new avenues to try to reach as many people as we can with historical information that is meaningful to them and that they can use as they move forward in their lives and in their communities connecting to the places where they live and connecting to each other over that shared history and heritage, even if they are, like me, not native to the place. Um, although I do feel like a Nevada, and I know I'm a neo-Nevada neo and having been here just a little over 20 years. 
Um, I want to start, I'm going to actually show you Reno Historical, and we will be walking through the website version today, and I'll be sharing my screen in a little bit. But before we get to that, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about Reno Historical and how it came about uh, and why and who was responsible for it. And then we're going to spend a lot of time looking at its content, which we've been adding to at a regular beat um, for the last 10 years. Uh, so it began um, in 2014, launched officially, but we had been working on it for several years before that. And I want to tell you kind of how it first came about. Um, I moved here to Reno in 2003 to teach at UNR, teach history and core humanities, and taught, as Neil mentioned, Nevada history, Western history, um, the history of cities, the history of the American West, and had written my dissertation about Reno, which became my book, Reno's Big Gamble. Um, but I also taught a course, I created a course called Public History. And public history is something that I had grown very interested in from working for the National Park Service during a few summers when I was in graduate school. Public history is dedicated to working with the public to produce history for the public. And we kind of contrast that with academic history that might be for a you know, university or um, this other kind of school scenario where you're sort of teaching history in an educational um, environment or writing history for fellow historians in academic journals and the like. Public history is intended to work with communities to produce history in ways that they can easily access. And it's everything from um, websites, which is what we'll talk about today in digital history, to historical markers, historic preservation, oral histories, projects, events, things that happen physically in communities. So I moved here in 2003 and being a historian and being someone who had been here a couple years before that doing research on Reno, I was struck really immediately by how little I could learn about Reno's history just by walking around. Um, especially in its areas that were so clearly historic, the downtown core buildings that I came to learn were the Riverside Hotel, the Washoe County Courthouse, places that didn't have a historic plaque or any marker that would tell me what they were. And knowing that through work with the National Park Service and other work that I had done, the easiest way to get people to appreciate the history of a place is to have something directly in front of them. And so that was something especially noticeable at the university where I was teaching, which has as its heart a National Register listed historic district, the historic quad and the buildings around it. But nothing was marked there uh, even on the outside to tell you that. So that was something that I was getting more interested in helping the community learn more about the history more quickly. My students uh, were interested in that too. So I started to work with Donnie Curtis, who was then the head of special collections at the UNR libraries. We started to work together in this field of digital history, thinking if something wasn't physically marked, which can be kind of difficult to coordinate and put together, what if we tried to do that virtually? What if we tried to create a map-based site where people could access the history of different locations, past and present, existing and not, in our Reno area, trying to be kind of uh, confined about it a little bit, uh, and in that way have a permanent resource for people to use. And we kind of explored some projects where we had students in my classes do some university history and created a website at the library. And so we got a start, but we realized we needed more help and we probably needed to use a platform that existed that we wouldn't have to create ourselves, not being uh, digital experts or coders. So we went to a, uh, we went to a conference of public history, public historians from all over the country and some from different places in the world and came upon this platform called Curate Escape. And this is the platform that we use. It's something that we got very excited about. We realized this is it. It's a website, but it also can function as an app. They both work a little differently, but they have the same content. It could be free um, for people to use in perpetuity. We would have to pay a small licensing fee to use the platform and then to get some technical support, but that was okay, well worth it for us. And it's produced by Cleveland State University. So it comes out of an educational university setting. So it had everything that we needed. I'm gonna start sharing my screen now so we can start to take a look at this together. This is the homepage for Reno Historical. It's changed a little over time and I'll talk about some of the upgrades we were able to make. Um, and you can learn uh, a little bit about it by going, it's just kind of scrolling down. I'm gonna go through all of these different aspects uh, in a minute. 
but a lot of different entities came together to make this happen. So we were able to pull on the resources from the University of Nevada, Reno, and particularly Special Collections and the University Archives. That was kind of our base. Uh, and then we started to approach different area archives, including the Nevada Historical Society, which very generously opened up their collection to us to use on this site as well for imagery and information. Um, incredible resource for our community and state. Uh, and then private collectors such as Neil Cobb, and others in the community who have been collecting photographs and maps and materials for a long time. We have a whole list of, of private donors who have allowed us to use their materials for free to put on this site. We also got some grants um, from the state libraries, from Nevada Humanities. We got some more grants later that I'm going to tell you about um, a little bit later. And other sponsored projects that have given us a lot of funding. So it's been something that has been added to over the years, and we have got a lot more funding through the years to do, um, but with that basis, always in education and always thinking about education to the broader public. Uh, we thought of many ways that a site like this could be used. And I'm gonna click on the top here um, to the map first to kind of show you what terrain we cover. It's really like a you know 30,000 foot level at this point because we have some far flung sites that I'll talk about um, that are actually outside of city limits. We did a little bit of cheating because we're mostly focusing on Reno. Um, but as you zoom in, there's a zoom function and it allows you to start seeing how many sites we have and where they are located. So being able to use the website allows every entry to have its own distinct URL, its own distinct email address. So people can link to a specific building, even to a specific photograph within the entry for a building. Uh, they can share it on social media. They can embed it in online stories. Media are often using these um, links and these stories. And so they can link directly to it, which is great. Um, you can plunk around on the map and you can just be in a specific area if you're interested uh, and trying to see what is in an area around you. You know, click on one of these numbers. Here's a site that no longer exists. Most of the sites are still standing, but we have a lot that we're calling site in parentheses, which means this is the site of this building, which is no longer standing. We probably are gonna start adding more sites to try to populate this with the history of places that are no longer there. But we do have a good, a good solid number, especially of well-known places, the Mapes Hotel, the historic Virginia Street Bridge, some of the older, you know, one of the older arches that's gone. Um, but this is showing you, okay, this is on the site of the current downtown post office that isn't actually the post office anymore, but it's the historic downtown post office that now has the basement and um, stores in it. But, you know, this is where the Carnegie Free Public Library was. This was the site. And so every entry has a number of components. It will tell you in that initial title, whether it's a site or if it doesn't have the word site, that means it's still standing. We've given it a historic name. Often buildings change use over time. For the most part, it will be the original name of the building, but sometimes it will be the most popular or enduring business that was on that site. So it can change a little bit, but we try to cover all those things uh, within the body of the text. So we'll have kind of an initial photograph that shows you kind of the basics. And then these entries are anywhere from, sometimes they're as short as 50 words, but we try to make them at least a couple of hundred, up to about 400 or 500 words tops. We don't want these to be extremely lengthy. We want them to be readable. So we're trying to give you a background. Uh, we don't usually post the sources here, but these are extremely vetted. And so I work as the historian and the manager for these and have all of the uh, primary sources and documents um, that we use for reference. Um, but this will show you, in this case, the Carnegie Free Library that was Reno's first public library. It was on that site right by the river. Um, each of these photos you can isolate and you can then look and read the caption. Whoops, I went too far. Um, and you can scroll down and learn more about it. Here's Andrew Carnegie, the philanthropist who ended up giving money to communities all over the world, well, all over the country. Um, for free public libraries. Um, we have some historic newspaper articles often that we have from clippings files or microfilm or other sources. Uh, and then we have photographs and images as much as we can to show you what this place looked like or looks like. Uh, and then you can be able to, you know, scroll through and see how things have changed over time. 
sometimes we have so many, we have a hard time picking <laughs> what we're going to use. Um, but then it'll show you the location. You can see where on the map you are now, and then you can open in, in Google Maps. So the way that it works on the app, again, the same content is on the app, but it will organize the stories when there's an initial list of stories here. That was the map. So on the top, I'm going over to stories. And you can see how it will just actually start with the last one that I entered. And I'll tell you a little bit more about these in a minute. Um, and you can just scroll through. So we have now 269. You can scroll through like this and see um, what we've just uh, you know, created uh, most recently and go through and read them. Um, if you're on the app, it will actually organize it. If you have your GPS on, it will organize it by what's closest to you. So if you have the Reno Historical app on your phone, it can be on Android um, or iPhone, that's how it will set it up. So you really can turn it on and just look at stories and it will tell you what you're nearby or what you are nearest. You might not be close to anything that's on the site yet, but it will tell you what's closest in mileage to where you are. Uh, so we really uh, liked the ability to be able to have these individual entries. It has an unlimited capacity. And another aspect that it allows us to do is create tours. And some of these are for the most part, thematically grouped, they're not intended for the most part to be walkable tours. And we make that very clear <laughs> so people don't end up trying to walk miles and miles and miles. Um, when we first started, we didn't want to launch it before having quite a bit of content. So when we launched it, like I say, we have about 269 entries now, I think. We launched it with about 70. And because we were based at, I'm going to come back to a bunch of these. Because we were based at the university, we had and had access to that full university archive, the University of Nevada tour of the historic buildings uh, at UNR, and it has uh, most of them, but not all of the historic buildings. Um, this is a very, very robust collection. So we were able to hire a student um, while it was based up there and an architectural historian named Amela Harmon, who has been a dear friend and colleague for a long time, who had been doing a lot of this research. Um, and they were able to really populate the site with a lot of material from the university and some other well-known Rito landmarks from the very beginning. Mela had written national register nominations for a lot of Nevada properties. And so we kind of took uh, properties and buildings that had a lot of information gathered already. So national register listed properties were uh, perfect for that because they already had full narrative histories that were already vetted and were very credible sources. So the beginning of these tours, when you have these visual, um, virtual tours, are to give you just a little bit of background here. This one is about the university. So it's uh, another entity having a big celebration with its sesquicentennial. Um, a little background on the university founded in Elko when it moved to Reno um, and some of the key aspects of its development, but not too long, right? And then it says here, this tour is arranged by chronological order of construction, not location. So don't try to go from one to the next to the next. We did it for from the oldest building, uh, Morrill Hall, the original building on campus first. Um, and so you can go through here. Now, I will say that as far as our choice of historical properties goes, we really follow the National, you know, National Park Service Secretary of the Interior Guidelines for Historic and the National Trust of Historic Places, which is 50 years old or older for something to be considered historic. And actually, the state of Nevada follows that guideline, too. That doesn't necessarily mean historically significant, but it's kind of the first cutoff point is 50 years ago. So we try to start with things that are older than 50 years ago. It's, of course, a moving target. We're up to 1974 now, which is hard for some of us to believe. Um, but that's kind of where we are. So, you know, anyway, we kind of do a lot of organizing chronologically. People are often very interested in what some of the oldest things are. So um, when you look at the Morrill Hall entry, for instance, you can see how it was just alone on a, on a lonely hill <laughs> um, up there. And so we have just a little bit of, of the, the history and then some pictures through time that show us what it looked like and how it changed. And um, just uh, there are so many photographs of Morrill Hall up at, uh, in the UNR archives, but we can see a view from the original entrance um, to the university here. Um, and a lot of the other buildings that are um, no longer on site, but surrounding Morrill Hall. So that's one of the um, examples then of a site that still exists, um, but that we can 
see its change over time. And it goes into its renovation. And of course, there was at one point a uh, talk of tearing down Moral Hall. Fortunately, it didn't last very long. Um, but you can see and under the tour, when you on a tour here, I'm over on the right. And I can just go to the next property on the tour. And so the next one on that tour, the next chronological in age, second oldest building on campus is Lincoln Hall. And so that's the way that the tours look is they allow you to kind of flip through in that way. Um, some have audio and video. This one, I'm not going to play this one, but this one has some audio of Dr. James Hulse, uh, who has just been an incredible supporter of every historical project. Um, passed away recently, a great loss. Um, but he lived in Lincoln Hall as a student and remembered and was remembering what that was like. He was, of course, a professor in the history department for decades. Um, so you can just go through and you can kind of see all these things. Now, one of the fun things I just want to point out about the, um, the tour here of the university is that when we had a student, she was going through a lot of the different um, materials that they had and came across some old historic video. So that's another thing that we have here. I just mentioned the audio with Dr. Hulse, but there are also some videos on the site. And so some of them are historic, some of them are a little more contemporary. But for instance, this is the entry for the university quad, which is itself a historic place. And it was the site of many um, traditional activities, one of them being Cane Rush. So our student put together a little videos that show you that kind of set it to some music. Um, but has this is kind of an incredible video. So that's a video that she puts together using archival photographs. And then I want to show you an actual historic video. So we have Manzanita. Well, let's see, which one should I go to? Okay, Manzanita Lake, some good stuff on here. Um, some more traditions included Mackie Day. And so we have some video, historic video of Mackie Day festivities from 1937. These are a lot of fun, so I'm not going to watch uh, the whole thing, but you can kind of go through and kind of see. And of course, people used to swim and canoe and do all sorts of things in um, Manzanita Lake, the man-made lake up there um, at the university. So we launched it with the tour of uh, the university. So that now has um, a number of entries. Let's see, I think it's up to around, we keep adding more because yeah, there's 20 locations on it now, but there are more things that fit within that 50 year category now. So we keep kind of adding to that one. Um, we also have a uh, wedding and divorce tour. That was something that Mella Harmon herself specialized in. Um, the history of the migratory divorce industry here. So we decided to put a tour together called Tying and Untying the Knot and have landmarks that relate to the wedding industry, which we explain here started in 1905, 1906, and went through the 1960s when Reno was known as the divorce capital of the world. So here we highlight, we can kind of group together sites that are individually throughout the site, but we group them together for these tours. So they include the courthouse where people would actually get their divorce, places like the Riverside Hotel, 
where they could stay, the historic Virginia Street Bridge, which is known as the Bridge of Sighs or the Wedding Ring Bridge. Um, there is a video there, we'll see if we have time to get back to it, um, where Neil Cobb and Mella Harmon were actually talking about the, is it a myth or not idea that people would fling their rings, their wedding rings into the Truckee River off the bridge. And uh, Neil confirmed that yes, indeed, he and his buddies had found many of <laughs> many rings uh, underneath the bridge in the water in the years when they were young. Um, so this is another way of trying to pull together a bunch of different entries and show us how they fit together to help tell a broader story. And that was something that was very important to me is that we have context. So each individually, um, each individually, each individual entry, you know, has its own context, its explanation for what that building is doing there. But these tours are allowing us to kind of give them together um, a bit more of a historical heft and, and tell a story because this is really about trying to tell stories. So uh, we put together a couple other tours from the beginning based on some of the entries that had a lot of information to us, like those National Register listings and such. Um, and so one of those is the schools and education um, where a lot of people are aware of the Spanish quartet group of historic elementary schools that are in a mission revival style. Mount Rose Elementary is the last one that's serving as an actual school, but the McKinley Park Arts and Culture Center obviously is the old McKinley School. Um, but we go even back further, the historic Huffaker Schoolhouse that's now on Bartley Ranch in Bartley Ranch Regional Park. Um, some that are no longer there, the Bishop Whitaker School for Girls that is on the site. Um, it's now Whitaker Park, but that does not exist anymore. So it's kind of the schools and education tour. We put one together having to do with religious landmarks. So those are some of the early things that we did. So we kicked off the site in 2014. The city of Reno held a wonderful event for us at uh, the Lake Mansion. And we encouraged people to take the first um, tour that we had created on here that is still just a terrific tour available to people, which is the historic riverfront walking tour. So we kicked that off in May of 2014. And the idea is that this is actually um, a walkable tour and that it goes in a circle and you could catch it at any point uh, along this. And, um, and then you can, if you click on the little map icon that's at the bottom right of the tours like this, you can see where those sites are all laid out. So that is a quick way to tell whether this is walkable or not. <laughs> so this is what you can see here is that this is a pretty, you know, generally pretty walkable. The Lake Mansion is a little bit up in elevation, but the rest of it is really right around the Riverwalk because this is, of course, um, where, you know, Reno's birthplace really with Lakes Crossing that predated the city of Reno's founding. Uh, you know, was centered here around the river. So that walkable tour is a great resource that you can go on, you can take people on that will tell you a little bit about, you know, the background of these buildings that are here, including um, starting at the post office, which as I mentioned, was the site of the Carnegie Free Public Library. You can then check out the Pioneer Center for the Performing Arts. You can cross the street to the Washoe County Courthouse. Uh, and then next to that, the Riverside Hotel, you can see the site of the Virginia Street Bridge. Keep walking along the river to the Trinity Episcopal Cathedral, up to the Lake Mansion. You can come back down and see the beautiful Regina Apartments, the cute little still vacant apartment building that's right next to Park Tower, but we've been assured will be uh, preserved. Wingfield Park, you can cross through Wingfield Park, go over to the 20th Century Club that's up on First Street. The First United Methodist Church is on West. Across from that is the Colonial Apartments, which is undergoing a renovation now, but we have been reassured is going to be just fine. It's undergoing an interior reservation uh, renovation. We have the Masonic Temple building that, this is one of those situations where we have the Masonic Temple, okay, not to be confused with the Masonic building the, that we unfortunately lost that was up on Commercial Row. Um, but this is an interesting example of a building that Oh, you say it's there. It doesn't look like that at all. Uh, well, it doesn't. <laughs> um, but this was the site of the Masonic Temple that was built in 1905. But today it, it actually had an unfortunate um, fire um, and it has been replaced by the building that is much more familiar to us, which is still the Masonic building, but now it looks like this. So in this case, it's still there. We didn't want to say site because there is a Masonic building. So this really kind of tells you the whole progression of that site. 
and how it's changed um, over time to a different building, but with you know the the primary tenants and its function for the most part remaining the same. And it always has had commercial entities on the ground floor and other entities like now we have Brew Cathedral, right? Um, so then you can kind of continue through and you can see the MAPES. Uh, you can learn about that. You can actually watch the uh, very sad video of its demolition, um, which no matter how you feel about how that building might have been saved or maybe not been saved, um, it was a very, very important building to the community. And so uh, we have the story of the MAPES here. We have pictures from the interior and the exterior, um, and you can see how that changes over time. Uh, and then kind of continuing here, we end up with the original City Hall, which was on the site of the current City Hall parking garage. Um, and we have a couple of city, we actually have three City Halls on Reno Historical. Um, and then next, going down to First Street, the Delucci Building, which is across from the ballpark, et cetera. So anyway, that's a tour that is a very popular one to take. And so I really encourage people to just get on the app and walk down there and you can look around and compare um, what you're seeing in front of you to what used to be there and um, entertain your friends and visitors and, and colleagues. So it's, it's one that I think um, is a lot of fun to look at. Now, one thing that I wanted to point out that we have on this site too, when you look at one of these entries, there are a couple little um, things you can click on. For instance, you can see above the Washoe County Courthouse here, we have government and politics. This is um, one of the categories that we have. You can click on that and everything that's tagged as government and politics will then show up. So things will usually have a main subject like that that you can click on if you're interested in some category. This is showing you fire stations, people who are connected to government as government figures, city halls, you know, county buildings, um, things like that. So those are subjects. Um, and then there are also tags. So if you go down, just kind of click down to the bottom here of this entry, you see the citation info, you have related tours. Um, and then these are the subject heads or government and politics, architecture, divorce, and then a lot of tags. So if you're interested in divorce or say Frederick DeLongchamps, who is a very prominent Nevada architect, you can click on Frederick de Longchamps and you will see everything we have that's designed uh, by Frederick de Longchamps. So there's a lot of ways to really cross reference the information here and group it together in different ways. And I think that's one of the really exciting aspects of this is if there's not a virtual tour already curated in a certain area of interest, it could be that you could click on a tag and you will be able to group together other you know, buildings that are related to that, to that subject. So stories and tours get added in different ways for different reasons. Uh, one of the first that we had was the tour of East 4th Street. So one of the ways that this happens is through sponsored projects. And the East 4th Street tour, I'm just kind of scrolling down here. We have a walking tour for kind of a finite part of East 4th Street, but we have entries that go all the way to the Sparks line. And again, we kind of cheated and we went a little bit over um, because there are a couple entities like Coney Island that are in Sparks, but we wanted to include on Reno Historical. So we did that for, for just a very few. But the East 4th Street project came along because RTC Washoe, the um, Transportation Commission, the Regional Transportation Commission of Washoe County, was doing a planning project to absolutely, you know, renovate, fix, improve 4th Street and Prater Way, um, put in bike lanes, ex you know, uh, expand the width of sidewalks. Uh, they did all sorts of, you know, new lighting, better for multimodal transportation and bus shelters and all that stuff. So when I was still at the university, they actually hired um, the oral history program that I directed at the time to start an oral history project about 4th Street with people who had worked on 4th Street, knew about the history of 4th Street as far back as we could go, had some kind of relationship to it. And I led a graduate seminar of oral history where my students were trained in oral history methods and history and sent them out to do these oral histories. And so after I left the university, which was in 2013, and started my own historical consulting firm, RTC continued to uh, work with me and hired me to create entries for Reno Historical based on some of that research we had done. And they hired me to do additional research also. So for instance, Louise Bass Corner, 
Um, I won't play these now, but I do encourage you to go back and listen to the audio we interviewed Louis and Lorraine Ergibel before they, the founders of Louis, ba Louis Bass Corner, before they both passed away. And I think that she passed away, like I think the year after. Um, and they talk about how to make a pecan punch and they talk about how to transform, how they transformed the restaurant, which was an Italian restaurant at the time into their Basque restaurant. Um, and we have pictures from that whole journey, this building long predated that by 60 years, um, 1907, I believe, um, as a little hotel. So this sponsored project by 4th Street allowed us to develop a lot of this content, allowed us to, um, and allowed me to go out and seek out new information, new photographs, go to the Historical Society, to UNR, um, and gather together all the information that we could to try to really beef up this site and create a whole tour just for East 4th Street. Uh, and then several years later, we actually did the same thing for Midtown. I worked on a project that was, again, planning for the RTC, RTC Washoe, were um, planning their whole project to redo Virginia Street, really through Midtown and all the way up through the university. So they, again, hired me to do research that helped them determine what was historically significant along the route, make sure they were being sensitive to that sort of thing. Um, and then I could put together this whole tour of Midtown sites. And so it goes all the way from Mount Rose Street on the south up through uh, California Avenue on the north, the Levy House, which is, of course, the home for a couple more weeks only of Sundance Books and Music, which is very heartbreaking that we all learned that they were closing. But it tells you the history of that home, um, of that house, and goes through the family members, the Levy family, who owned Palace Dry Goods, which is now actually part of the building that became Club Calneva uh, between Virginia Street and Center Street downtown. Um, so I interviewed Christine Kelly, you know, of, of Sundance to kind of talk about what the house meant to her. So there are about 30 entries, I think, on the Midtown tour. And this being already the foundation of a lot of knowledge about Midtown actually allowed us to pitch the idea of putting historic plaques on Midtown as one of the final pedestrian amenities for the RTC's project. The Midtown Business District loved that idea. City of Reno and RTC Washoe funded more research and the plaques themselves. And we just put 14 historic plaques on historic buildings throughout the Midtown area just a couple months ago. Um, we just announced that. So that's a way that it kind of comes full circle, you know, to bring this, this history back to um, the plaques that I had been sort of noticing from the beginning uh, were, you know, were absent. And so now we have these at a lot of different sites throughout throughout Midtown. And it's really exciting to see um, that people are very interested in that history and they can just walk along uh, the street. They can see the building that is currently uh, Michael's Deli, which is here, which is actually the Savage and Son had that building constructed to move their offices out of downtown in 1940. And we have historical uh, photographs of that. So I love the idea of bringing the history up to the present um, on the Reno Historical Site, we try very hard to keep everything current. The great thing about a digital project is that I can instantly correct, revise, add anything on the site, and it will immediately update the website and the app, which is great. Sometimes we make, we make mistakes. I'm the editor, but, you know, uh, sometimes I get things wrong. So uh, we really try to vet everything, and sometimes we just need to update things right away, which we can. So I'm hoping that that historic plaque project is just the beginning. In the meantime, the city of Reno did start their own historic plaque uh, program based on funding. And so there are some plaques now on Pioneer Center downtown, um, on a couple other locations, and then through Midtown. This is one of the first areas where we have them in kind of substantial numbers. So that's one of the ways that we add sites is through sponsored projects like the RTC projects with um, Midtown or uh, 4th Street. Another way, uh, another reason that we add sites onto this, including full virtual tours, is when some sites are threatened. And that was um, one of the main reasons that we wanted to that we were inspired to do Reno Historical was as a preservation tool. Um, sometimes when something immediately appears threatened, and that's usually what happens is that it kind of comes out of nowhere. You know, people will often say, why didn't you do something? You know, if you really wanted to preserve that building so badly, why didn't you do something earlier? And often it's because we didn't know it was threatened. <laughs> you know, these buildings are generally 
um, although not always, but privately owned and people can really have no idea what people's intentions are for them. So in a way, one of the things we're trying to do, obviously, is educate people about these historic sites and places proactively through the majority of the site. But sometimes when there are some that are threatened immediately, we really try to get entries up really quickly so people can start linking to them, learning about those sites. They can link to them in um, in media, articles, anything that's online, on social media to try to spread the word. And so the University Gateway was, of course, the area between Interstate 80 and the main university campus. It started at, at 9th Street, um, traditionally. Uh, lots of historic Victorian houses in there. And so those were purchased by the university and the preservation community was trying very hard to get the university to keep them in place, um, if possible, reuse them, make a little retail district or something like that. Um, and then if not that, then try to get these relocated. So um, Deb Hinman had been the person who had led for the Historic Greener Preservation Society, the university tour for many years. And so the hub of a lot of this information um, is from her. So we put up this site when it was not in memoriam. Um, it was just the site of the University Gateway to try to draw attention. A wonderful contemporary professional photographer, Emily Nahara, has had these beautiful photographs um, of the houses that mostly dated many of them to the 1890s. Um, we put them in historical context. You know, we had some you know photographs if we if we had them available. Um, newspaper articles again, how they had changed through the years. And so um, once the buildings there were either moved in some cases, some were relocated, and you can see um, on the tour which were relocated and which were not. Some are sites, some have been relocated. Um, then we kept the tour in that place and we called it in memoriam because people really are interested in thinking about those buildings all together. But when they have been moved somewhere else, we do say in the site that this was moved to this other location and, and that's where you can find it today. Um, so preservation concerns are often a reason that we've added tours and um, and we will keep, you know, we keep the buildings up obviously on the site. Um, in 2019, Reno Historical moved the administratively to the Historic Reno Preservation Society. And there were a couple of reasons for that. Um, the university um, special collections, Donnie Curtis was sort of moving along. They were focusing a lot on their archi archival collections. And it became a good time to move it out of the university and into the community, but specifically with the Historic Reno Preservation Society, because there are so many um overlapping joint collaborative efforts that we had already engaged in, but we have the same mission, which is education. Um, education about history, about historic buildings, and also the effort to try to preserve that history, um, those stories, but also those tangible buildings for future generations. And so it has been an incredibly fruitful uh, collaboration that began in, in 2019. It provided more stability um, and also a better ability to kind of coordinate with a lot of educational and preservation related activities. So a couple of things that we added right away under HARPS um, were what's sort of one of the most popular um, tours, which is Mansion on the Bluff. Mansions on the Bluff, if you're familiar with the mansions, at least the large buildings, they're not all mansions. We sometimes like to call things mansions here that aren't really mansions, but <laughs> they're really big houses. So um, on California Avenue, on Court Street, on Elm Court, in the area up there in the Newlands Heights area, that is an area that um, a lot of people are interested in because they just see those buildings and wonder what they are and there's nothing on the outside to tell you. So um, the longtime um, tour leaders, uh, Donna and Paul Erickson and Zoanne Campana uh, and others helped with giving us the research that they had available. They took new photographs of these buildings. Um, and you can go through and you can walk around. It's not too far to go um, to see all of them, but that's of great interest. And so we were able to do that. Another tour that we added through HARPS was an initiative that HARPS has been doing, which is the watch list. Um, and started a watch list that is not necessarily, these aren't buildings that are necessarily threatened right away. We're just keeping an eye on them. Maybe they are vacant or partially vacant. Um, they seem to be, you know, in the crosshairs maybe of some development that's going on and we don't know what's happening um, with it. So some of these have already been kind of moved around a little, but the Benham Belts house you might have heard of more recently. We think that it may be at its heart um, the oldest house, definitely the oldest house on the original Reno town site, but perhaps the oldest house in Reno city limits that was built 
when it was Reno. And I say that because there are some ranch houses that are in the area that probably predate Reno, but they weren't in Reno at the time. Um, so the Ben and Bell's house are on West Street. And this actually came about because um, Jenny Kane, who was a Reno Gazette Journal reporter, asked me, she wanted to do a story about it because Jacobs Entertainment had bought all the land, a lot of the land around it. And it's just this little loner. And she said, what do you know about this? And I said, well, I know a little, but not that much. And um, because of her, I took a really deep dive into the history of this house and then made those conclusions, you know, having looked at these are our Sanborn maps. These are old fire insurance maps that show you the footprint of the city at any given time. Uh, what's yellow on them is wood. What's pink is brick. Um, blue is stone often. This is an irrigation ditch kind of going through the area. But we're able to look at these maps all the way back to the 1870s. Um, and then we have other research too. People always ask, how do you find this stuff out? City directories, historic newspapers, U.S. census records, all of these Sanborn maps are available free from the U.S. Library of Congress. Um, there are all of these ways that we cross-reference information. Washoe County has done an incredible job of putting historical records online. So the Washoe County Recorder's Office is a place where you can search through. It's a little tricky once you, you know, but once you figure it out, you can find original property deeds all the way through the 60s that stem back to even prior to the founding of Reno in 1868. So we have all these types of things at our disposal to really try to piece together the history of places. And of course, Jacobs Entertainment decided to sell that house to someone who would um, take it away and move it off site. And so I think they have decided that. I'm not sure exactly where it's going, but we've been reassured it will be preserved somewhere, um, I think within the city. Um, but that was really why we had that created. Um, but the, you know, the watch list just has other buildings that, you know, okay, the second floor, this is a downtown building, it's second floor, or it's even more floors than that have been vacant for a long time. Vacancy is the worst thing for preservation, right? You need to have a building in use to know that it is being cared for, people are looking at it, it's being up, you know, it, it, it has upkeep and everything. So um, we have a lot of buildings on here that the Historic Reno Preservation Society just keeps kind of updating this watch list every year. But it allows you to have a good look at like, what are what are the preservation people, you know, a little concerned about right now, um, whether it's the freight house that's right next to the Greater Nevada Field um, or the First Church of Christ Scientist, which, you know, is the Lear Theater, of course, owned by the city of Reno now, but it's vacant. So we're keeping an eye on it. Right. Um, that's what that list allows us to do. Um, other tours that are on here that we added include the list of the Reno Register of Historic Places. And that is something where I just have to keep um, keep kind of catching up to the city because they're doing such a great job adding more buildings to the Reno's city register. We have a lot of buildings that are on the national register, uh, but the Reno city register, they've been kind of adding more and more just in this year. I think there are four that were added. So that's something that we work in close collaboration with the city of Reno to try to keep up to date. Um, other things that we have been doing is recognizing the need for more diversity. It is something that you cannot study the history of Reno or of Nevada in general and not see that we need to have more history of underrepresented communities firmly in our mainstream narratives about history. And so a project that came out of work that I was doing with the State Historic Preservation Office in 2019 on African American history throughout the state uh, led to a collaboration with the nonprofit organization Our Story Inc. to do a virtual tour of Black Springs. Black Springs is in uh, unincorporated Washoe County, but it's just a couple miles north of Reno and there's Reno, <clears throat> actually city of Reno kind of surrounding it <clears throat> due to some annexations. So we figure it kind of, it's close enough, right? Our Story Inc. is a wonderful organization dedicated to underrepresented communities. And so working with them on a documentary that was recently produced by Nevada Humanities and on a number of these entries, for houses. There are a couple churches in this area. This was a historically Black community founded in the late 1940s um, that uh, a lot of the buildings are still there. The houses are still there, a couple of churches, the community center. Uh, and we wanted to tell that story. So Black Springs is an incredible community. It's an incredible story. We have uh, just this past week, I actually had residents send me new photos of some of their houses here. So there's a great sense of collaboration where we're working with the communities to put photographs of their families um, on the site and that we keep it up to date with how things are looking there as that community has just started to hold um, 
reunion homecoming events, and they're documenting their history even more. And we're working on some oral histories as we move forward um, with that community as well. We also have a tour related to Paul Revere Williams architecture, uh, African-American architect from Los Angeles. I was doing a project with the Nevada Museum of Art that um, was focused on John Ireland's photography of Williams' work in Nevada. And they hired me to do some research into all of Williams' work in Northern Nevada and Central Nevada. So I was able to use that research to create a tour for the architecture of Paul Revere Williams. Um, another really exciting venture that we did was grant funded by the John Ben Snow Foundation. And that was specifically to get more information related to underrepresented communities on Reno Historical and allow us to promote them more. So as a result of that, we were able to give stipends to a number of writers who would write us entries related to um, some of the minority communities or you know communities that really hadn't been represented much on Reno Historical. Uh, we hired Sharon Honig Bear. She wrote a number of articles related to Reno's Jewish history with the historic um, and contemporary temples um, and some other content. Uh, we also worked with um, uh, a number of others to put in more information here with our story, um, Club Harlem, the Dixie Club, other places that are related to the African-American history of primarily Northeast Reno. We're starting to embark upon a new project on the African-American history of Northeast Reno with the city of Reno that I'm hoping will lead to a lot more documentation of buildings related to the area of Northeast Reno where um, a majority of African-Americans lived for many, many decades. So that's going to be, um, I think, a really, really informative um, and instructive and educational component because of course there were so many neighborhoods throughout the city of Reno and Sparks and throughout the country where due to restrictive racist racial covenants, people who were not white could not live in these neighborhoods. And that basically is gonna to correspond to many of the subdivisions that were founded in Reno from the late 1920s through even the 1950s and sometimes into the 1960s. That means that the areas that were founded prior to the mid 1920s often were the most diverse areas, which is why this area just north of East 4th Street uh, and on the east side of town was where we have a lot of uh, members of that community living. And, you know, all the way through today, there are many of the historic, you know, black churches that are contemporary um, and still in operation today are located there, too. So that's going to be something that we're going to be able to explore. Some of the histories that we um, try to explore in this component and with that grant don't have any photographs, you know. So, again, we're trying to be using these Sanborn maps and other historic um, materials to try to show the story of, you know, early African-American landowner Martha Jackson, who lived in a central part of the Reno town site and was offered, I think, twelve thousand um, dollars. She actually made um, the people who were trying to offer it um, bump up their price <laughs> and offer her more money because they wanted to expand the business district. And she lived on the edge of Chinatown. And this was on the corner of Second and Center Streets. So we know where her house was. We could identify that through these maps. She's buried up at Hillside Cemetery. Um, and we have newspaper articles that kind of show us how she was offered this money and she held out for more. Um, and this was the building that they wanted to build. This was the Oddfellows um, building that was then constructed on the site of her house. She got a lot of money. She retired. She sort of moved um, uh, over, I think, to Sparks after that. Uh, this was originally a five-story building, uh, the Oddfellows building. The top two floors burn off in, I think, 1940, early 40s. And this is what it looks like today. That's another building that has a lot of vacant space in it. So that's another one that we're kind of keeping an eye on um, to think about what else could happen inside, you know, in that building to revitalize it. Um, so that foundation grant was very, very helpful and one of the other stories that I just want to highlight because it was just so much fun to work on was that I had just came across this picture. I came across this photograph at the Historical Society, which kicked off this exploration to me of what was this place, Tom's Laundry, because there was a little caption on the back um, and it said circa about 1902, and this was Tom's Laundry and that it was in Reno. So using all of our tools that we have, I could look up newspaper articles, city directories, find out who this person was and find out that, yeah, he actually had his laundry next to Martha Jackson's. Um, he similarly was offered a lot of money 
um, because this is what happened with Chinatown. This is what happened with anybody who was in a minority um, you know, population is that the mainstream population of Reno kept wanting to move them further and further east, sometimes violently and with a lot of force, um, as happened with Chinatown. Um, but even individually, just to buy people out and keep expanding the business community. So these there isn't there aren't any remnants of this that we can see. So we have to reconstruct these stories. And we were able to put it all together. Um, he sold this corner lot, which he bought for $3,500. For $15,000, it's just a remarkable story, again, of a member of an underrepresented community kind of taking advantage of the capitalist <laughs> society here. And we think one of these men uh, must be, um, he was known as Tom, but I think his name was, he was generally called Su Wa or Wa Su. You know, sometimes you have to really deal with the fact that people have different names in um, in the newspapers and through other coverage. But I just really loved working on that one. And the fact that there was such a wonderful photograph of it gives us the initial clues to dig a little bit deeper. Um, so just um, to kind of wrap up a little bit here, you know, sometimes there, you know, someone is just asks me a question, do I know anything about this building? And I tend to have a lot on my computer and I can actually put up a, a you know, a site or a story really quickly. Um, there are, are a couple of buildings, for instance, the Oxbow Motor, Lo Motor Lodge um, is in Midtown. It's just reopening now as the best bet as kind of a very upgraded spa like motel. Uh, and so I put up an entry for the owners of that who hadn't really been aware of its history. And so um, now we have it kind of defined there who built it, that it was the Oxbow Motor, Motor Lodge. Um, I have a lot of things on the wish list. You know, we have an editorial board that um, we uh, need to kind of convene again and kind of go through and say, what do we want to do next? Um, I want to start putting more indigenous history on the website, and that's going to allow us to use the map a little differently, you know, because there are stories that take place. Uh, all over the place that aren't necessarily tied to a specific spot on the map. And so we're working, have some initial conversations with the Reno Sparks Indian Colony to figure out how we can, how we can tell that kind of stories that are relevant to that community. Um, the Wells Avenue area, we don't have very much at all uh, in the Wells Avenue area, even though Wells Avenue is a historic conservation district um, for the city, but we just haven't gotten to it really. <laughs> um, so Wells Avenue itself with the commercial buildings, but all of the residential area um, that is uh, you know, around Wells Avenue, you can see we don't have anything really on the map in that area, so we want to do that. Um, the rest of downtown's historic buildings, past and present. I have a tour that I started called Historic Gambling Clubs and Casinos. I'd like, because people are so interested in those, I'd like to make sure that we have those historic gambling clubs and casinos on there all the way up through the Nugget, the Horseshoe. We have a number of them. We have Club Cal Neva, of course, Holiday Hotel and the Mapes and the Riverside. But I think I want to get more of them up there so people can use this as a resource. Um, more motels. Again, I started a tour about motels and kind of our motor history. So I'd like to get more motels up there because they are very threatened as a type of vernacular architecture that was very important to Reno and has been throughout its whole history as a crossroads. Um, and then I'm just kind of open to other ideas too. Again, I work as the editor and the manager, but we have a lot of people who are contributing to the site who continue to you know write the stories, um, suggest stories, give me materials for stories. Uh, and so it really is a work in progress. We're up to, as I say, 269 stories, which is great, but it's unlimited. And there are always so many more stories to tell. And there are people who are constantly giving me more photographs. And I'll just end with this one because I think it's just so much fun. This is 40 Mile Saloon. It's in Midtown. I was calling it Dunks for a while because that was kind of the earliest photos I had or when it was a bar called Dunks. Um, we have this picture here from when it was Dunks in the 1950s. But someone just wrote me and said, hey, you know what? Um, that's my grandmother's uh, and her husband's bar, E.B. Aubrey. Here's some photos of it. <laughs> wow, amazing, right? So now we have even older photos from Mr. Aubrey. I renamed it Aubrey's Grocery because he ran it as a grocery with gas pumps. This whole part is gone now. This whole port crochet that used to be over the gas pumps. But you can see where they were attached to the building on the present day building. Um, and this is the inside, that's Aubrey and his wife. But then we have picture, a lot of pictures of it through the years because it was just on a main thoroughfare there and it was called a lot of different things. This is this 40 mile saloon. You can see where that pork share was attached and we see where there used to be a, some windows and, and a door, those little ghostly figures. So I just love kind of seeing that. So it's really to me a very alive site, very dynamic that will has potential that I think we haven't even really begun to tap.
I'm going to end there because I've gone through a full, <laughs> I think I've gone through my allotted time. I don't know if you have time for questions, but I'm happy to answer any. We just have okay. one question and that is, um, you sort of answered this, but have you researched or included anything on the native tribal history of the area or do you have plans to add that? We do have plans. So I've been working with uh, Michonne Evan for a long time. Uh, when I was the head of the oral history program uh, at the university, actually worked with the Rito Sparks Indian Colony to start their own oral history program, which they did. And they have been doing incredible work with that. For a while, I was training um, members of the community to conduct those interviews, but now they just do it themselves. So they have been collecting their history um, and keeping it, it's a private collection. You know, they've been keeping it to um, themselves. And so we have one, there's one entry in the grounds of the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. It's actually where the cultural programs are housed, which is the historic field matrons cottage. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. And it's, um, so that building is on, um, is on Reno Historical, but it is not so much about, you know, the indigenous history or culture so much as it was, you know, a little bit of a colonialist kind of story. Um, so we have that on there, but we have ideas to talk about more. And I think that these will be not so much placed on a building, on a structure, but we'll talk about how we can, you know, use the landscape and talk about the meaning of the river and different spaces um, and of, you know, different resources that were available in this area. So yes, that is a plan. And we just have sort of tried to figure out how do we, how do we break this structure a little bit of these pinpoints and think a little bit more about how to use the map in a different way. So thank you for that question. It's going to be a really exciting stage. Okay. Well, I downloaded the app while you were speaking, so I'm very excited to explore it. It looked very good. Thanks so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you to Alicia Barber, to Christina Hornbeck, and Neil Cobb with the Nevada Historical Society, and to Tim, this month's Washoe County Library System Tech Wizard, for making this event possible today. Thank you, and have a good day.